Well, welcome to another edition of AP, where we're looking at profiles in Christian ministry. There are so many great things happening around the Presbyterian Church of Australia. And today I have with me a very special guest, my old minister, in fact, uh, Kevin Murray, who is the National Director of APWM. Welcome, Kevin, to the show. It's great to have you with us. Good to be here, and all the good things I've ever learned in ministry, I learned from you. Uh, you always say that. So kind. Actually, I was the minister. Oh, sorry, I was the moderator of New South Wales before Kevin, so I had the great opportunity to sort of share with him some of the things that I learned. And again, I learned from you. <laughs> um, Kevin, for a lot of people in the church would know you already, but give us a quick, a, a quick. Um, snapshot of how you first came to faith and then what brought sure. you into ministry. Okay. Um, I, I was born in Glasgow in Scotland uh, from a really, really nominal Roman Catholic background. Uh, in fact, I don't know anyone in my family that was a Christian mm. at all. Um, and so came to Australia when I was four years old and my parents never went to church. Uh, they died when I was about 13. Um, and uh, from then on, life was a struggle for me. Just what was the point to life uh, now, now that that hap had happened? But I could see that God was actually at work in my life all along, just mm. calling me yep. from this background. And at 17, I heard the gospel uh, within two weeks of going near a youth group and was soundly converted. Wow. Wow. There you go. Yeah, fantastic. And now what brought you from conversion then into Christian ministry? Okay. Um, the church I belonged to was a Presbyterian church. It joined the Uniting Church. But I could see that week after week, the Bible wasn't being consistently taught. Mm. And I thought, if you can't beat them, join them. Mm. And actually, I prayed a really interesting prayer. I prayed, Lord, if you want me to go to Bible college, please send an angel to the bottom of the bed. And oh, so okay. I, I prayed that prayer and didn't tell another human being. It's only prayer in some ways. Uh, but two weeks later, a friend and I, we went to a local uh, church, a uh, Bible study group. There was only, say, six senior ladies there. And suddenly in the min middle of this Bible study, the minister says, you know, when God wants someone to go to Bible college, he does not send an angel to tell them. No human being knew that I'd prayed that prayer. Mm. And um, so I went to more college next year. <laughs> Oh, great. I hadn't heard that story before. Um, interesting. Uh, now, you're actually the national director of APWM. Yep. Some people might get this confused because you're based in Sydney across yep. college. They might think that you're employed by the New South Wales State Committee. That's not true, is it? No, I'm actually employed by the national church, if you can say that. And we work in really close cooperation with all of the state uh, APWM committees, but we've got a national committee. That's, uh, that is a joy to work with. Yeah, uh, You don't get out of bed in the morning and think, oh no, today's National Committee Meeting Day. It's actually really good fellowship, really working the problem and using all of the gifts and skills together. Yeah, whenever I see your Facebook profile uh, come up in my news feed, you're always some part in the world. COVID must be a, a very difficult time for you because here you are, <sighs> no international travel, no visiting missionaries. No, no travel even within Australia on plane. So I haven't flown since February, which for me is really, really weird. I'm actually quite a nervous flyer in some ways, and um, I'm not looking forward to getting back on a plane because I've, mm. I've got out of the habit of doing that. Yeah, so it's unusual for me to not be in a place like Ethiopia or Vanuatu or somewhere else in the world, yeah, and just travelling through airport lounges. Yeah, I know it's a great passion for you to visit people, encouraging people, mm -hmm. uh, both local churches as well as missionaries. What developed for you your interest in cross-cultural missions? That's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, reading the Bible, mm. okay? You can see God's heart there for people that are lost. And I think probably as Australian Christians, we don't use that terminology anymore. We don't talk about people being lost. Mm. And people are lost without Christ. Yeah. So it, I think that's at the heartbeat of the, of the Bible. Uh, but then over the years, in my early Christian life, uh, I would go to the CMS summer school each year when it was much smaller than it is today and I would get my often my annual Bible teaching because the church where I was attending wasn't very big on the Bible. And um, and so just hearing those CMS missionaries being interviewed and talking, etc. Uh, and then I guess in 1990, the turning point for me in some ways, I was the minister at Strathfield. Mm. Ian and Jenny Smith, Ian is now the principal at Christ College, they were serving in Vanuatu, and Julie and I went and visited them. Oh, right. And um, I suddenly saw how accessible mission was yeah. and just some of the possibilities. And I started to get involved in trying to support Tailua 
uh, while I was here in Australia. We started up a book fund and other things. And just over the years, I just got to know more and more missionaries. And uh, then when I was at Strathfield, we had a number of people put their hand up and say, I want to serve overseas. Mm. And um, but I don't know where to begin, and we'd help them walk through that process. Yeah, um, and that just kept that interest going. So that when I came to this position, I already knew quite a few missionaries because I think what they do is so interesting. Mm. Yeah, the Presbyterian Church of Australia has had you know a fantastic um, strategic. Uh, what would you really call it? Influence, uh, in particularly in the South Pacific. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. uh, the story of John Patton and yeah. the New yeah. Hebrides is yeah. just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, how do you think we're going as a as a national church with missions? Uh, were they the glory years and we're really right. not doing yeah. much now? Yeah. How, how do you think it compares? Well, I, I guess um, in the early, 20, early 20th century, there was a lot of interest in mission. Um, but then we had the influence of liberalism. Right. Um, we had the formation of what was called the Board of Ecumenical Relations. Yep. Uh, but then in 1977, when the Uniting Church came into being, uh, we had to essentially press the reset button on yeah. the denomination. And one of the things we did then was we said, right, let's not just send Presbyterian people to Presbyterian mission fields. Right. Let's work with the agencies. We're actually quite unique, our okay. church. Because we work with all of the mission agencies that are evangelical. In fact, um, one of the things that shocked me, surprised me, delighted me when I uh, came into this role Mm. was the level of cooperation uh, between all the agencies. We work together. We know each other. Yeah. And um, I think if you had the same sort of cooperation in the church as you had having the agencies today, you would have a different church. Mm. Um, it, It really is quite remarkable. And so we're just part of that. And I think also, I think since 1977, there's been a resurgence of interest in mission. Um, sadly, though, my, my gut feeling is that that level of interest is not as strong amongst younger generations as it was in older generations. Yeah, why is that? I, I don't know. That, that's a good question. Uh, but it's the older generations that will sometimes um, leave money in wills and that sort of thing, yeah. um, which... Help to keep us going. That's a great, a great thing. Um, but occasionally we'll get letters from little old ladies, if I can put it mm. like that, with twenty dollars in the gift for some particular cause. And I think that's that there's something there. So I know a lot of young people really love doing short term missions. Yeah. What do you think are some of the benefits of that, and also some of the dangers? Because I've heard you write about this as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I forgot what I've written. Um, <laughs> some of the dangers, I think, I'll start with them first of all, is that mm. you can go to some parts of the world and think, well, I've seen everything there is to know about mission. I'm an instant expert. Yeah, well, We can all do that. Um, sometimes someone might go to a place like, say, Port Vila and Vanuatu and think, mm. hey, this is Vanuatu. It's yeah. not. Uh, it's a bit like going to, say, Sydney and thinking this is all of Australia. So there's, there's a danger there in that, um, I guess... Um, yeah, we just have to be realistic. Uh, learning about mission takes a lifetime. I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years and I've still got so much more to learn yeah. about mission and the, and the way that it functions and operates in the world. Um, but some of the... Yeah, some of the benefits? So, some of the benefits, I think it expands. It expands uh, your vision of what God is doing in the world. God is doing great things around the world right now. Sometimes from our Western perspective here in Australia, we just think, oh, oh no, the church is shrinking, the gospel is going backwards, but it's actually going forwards Mm. in lots of ways around the world. So it can expand your vision. Um, Years ago on television, there was one of those home improvement uh, reality shows, and their tagline was, I can do that. And I think sometimes if you go overseas, you meet missionaries, you see some of their contexts, you come back and you think, that's actually accessible. Mm. Maybe God is calling me uh, to leave the comfort of Australia and to go and serve people overseas. So it expands. So it's quite fascinating as you move around churches, around the state, around the country, do do you see, what do you see is the level of interest and involvement in missions, both at a local level and international it's pretty mixed i think right um sometimes i'll go to churches that are struggling and at morning tea time mm. i might talk to one of the elders and say how are you going and then i might slip in the question so what outreach are you doing locally yeah and um the answer sometimes comes back not much really yeah and they wonder why they're struggling 
uh, to, to win people for Christ. Because yeah. one of the problems with the church is sometimes we can become comfortable. We think, okay, I can pay the stipend, meet the expenses, yeah. keep the lights on, and we'll just cruise at that level. Yeah. And yet fail to think that we need to have our church buildings filled eight times over each Sunday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, a, a vision sometimes I think is, is far too small. Um, there's a danger, though, I think, also if some churches, they focus so much on overseas mission, they forget about local mission. Right. You know, um, some Christians, I think, mission happens wherever I am not. <laughs> you mm. know, so it happens in a remote country or the outback of Australia uh, and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that we have been experimenting with, along with Presbyterian youth recently, is last year we sent a a, a team to Japan yep. to first-hand experience what it's like to be serving as a missionary in Japan. We're hoping that some of the people there might want to serve in Japan. But actually the aim of that project uh, was to get people to think, could I use some of the thinking and, and strategies that I've seen overseas? Okay. And replicate them, he- them back yeah, here. Use them here yep. in, in cross-cultural Sydney. Yeah. Uh, that team has just cancelled on us because of COVID in November this year. So, yeah. Now, there's an interesting thing. I, um, I don't know if it's an urban legend. I'll have to ask David Cook when he, when he next time I see him. Um, but apparently at over one of the doors at SMBC was this very cryptic phrase that said, as now, so then. As now, so then. And apparently it meant, as you are serving the Lord now, so you will serve the Lord then mm, yes. when you go overseas. Yes. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you if you're not doing it here, why would, why would you do it there? Mm. Um it's yeah. not like you necessarily get the gift of evangelism when you get a no, passport. No, no, there has to be some consistency. Uh, it's a bit like when people want to go into parish ministry. Mm. What are you currently doing now before you go to college? Yeah, I mean, because people with those gifts will be exercising them within the church without necessarily being asked to do anything. Mm. So, yeah, I think, yeah, there's, there's got to be a consistency there in what people do. What about for the young person that is just gung-ho, wants to forsake everything, uh, go off and go to the mission field. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd probably have, you know, more than hopefully a few coming through your doors applying to go that way. How, what's your general advice, or not so much advice, but even a um, yeah. response to somebody yeah. Yeah. showing that initial interest? Yeah. I guess, first of all, talk to the church leadership, your elders, your yeah. pastor. Yeah. Do they see this gift in you? Because there are some people that volunteer to go and serve overseas but maybe that was not the best thing for them. Their, right. their personality, their gifting just doesn't fit into that category. Yeah. Um, so that's an important thing. What does the local leadership think? Mm. And secondly, what can you do now? Yeah. Uh, particularly if some, someone is interested in a particular country. Mm. Um, so, for example, let's say someone is interested in serving amongst Muslims in South Asia. Yeah. There are pockets of those people here in Sydney. Why not go and serve now amongst those pockets? Yeah. Yeah. Get a feel, learn some of the language. Yeah. See if this is a realistic thing for you, or is it just the romanticism of overseas mission? That's that that's a very a interesting point, isn't it? Um, yep. uh, our own church, Cornerstone um, Presbyterian Church here in Sydney, we were running um, a mission, a cross cultural mission to um, students from China you know, at uh, Macquarie University, and it was so difficult to find people to come and join us uh, in actually ministering to people that was just the other side of the Parramatta River wow. is there a just a sexiness a romanticism in the overseas life how much of there is there a danger in that your that's, thoughts that, that's interesting I mean I, I I live in the Hurstville area yeah. um, one of the things we very just, multicultural yeah yeah it, well, it's, uh, we look I preached at Hurstville a few years ago yeah did a roll call before I preached Hurstville Congregation has thirty different countries of birth. Wow! So that's become even more cross-cultural than when you were there. Yeah. Um, but my experience is people uh, from other cultures, other than Ang- Anglo culture, for them religion is part of life. So there's a real openness there that you don't get with a lot of Anglo Australians. I find. Yeah. Um, so that's fascinating that they didn't want to necessarily jump at that, because I find that for non-Anglo background people, religion is part of life, and they want to talk about it. Yeah. They want it. They want to talk. Yeah, you don't have to hide in a corner, and you know it's mm. it's like breathing. Mm. Yeah. I've heard an old saying that missions is caught just as much as it's taught. Uh, so you know the benefit of short term missions, yeah, yeah. Um, but also particularly the benefit of reading. 
and being yeah. inspired yep. by good Christian biography, yeah. Yeah. good Christian books. What are some books that you would recommend to people to really, you know, stoke the fire of their energy for mission, both locally and overseas? That's an excellent question, and I might happen to have some books on oh, hand here. There you well. go. Look at uh, that. Uh, this is a great book. Tim Chester, Mission Matters, Love right. Says Go. I think they originally were a series of addresses at a Kesey convention in the okay. UK. But um, w- one of the features of this is it's a fantastic, accessible, biblical theology of mission. Right. What's the big picture in the Bible on mission? Because a yep. lot of people think mission starts in Matthew 28. Yeah. <laughs> Actually goes back to Genesis 3.15. Um so that's really easy to read. Um, okay, so it's, yeah. it's quite good a biblical theological um, examination yeah. of the yeah. topic, right? Yeah. But also very personally challenging. Okay, how can this be applied okay. in your life? So really good, right? Uh, another one, and this is an area that we don't think about very much. I think here in Sydney, for example, is um, Tim Chester's other book, Unreached. Okay, all about sharing the gospel with the the working class, urban poor, whatever you want to call them. I, I don't know if you're aware, but in recent years, Mez McConnell, right. um, Rez, 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 I think is, sorry, Mez, um, Irish background, currently ministering in a thing called 20 Schemes, yep. 20 housing estates in Edinburgh, seeking to plant churches amongst the the urban poor of Scotland, where I'm from. Um, but it's a real attempt to say to middle-class churches, why are you so comfortable have you forgotten the blue collar people, the people that are struggling in life? It's look, it's really easy to minister, I think, in some ways to the you know university educated middle class. But what about those that really struggle? See, with we're life seeing a class? massive shift now, aren't we? Those countries that were sending missionaries, we're yep. now sending to, like you mentioned, Glasgow, where you're from, yeah, yeah, which was really like the mother yes, church yeah. for the Presbyterian Church yeah. of Australia. Now we're really sending missionaries back there, aren't we? Well, Scotland's become very secular. Right. Very, very secular, very difficult. And that's one reason why David Robertson has come to, to Sydney um, rather than remaining uh, where he was in Dundee. Um, so, yeah, we need to think, I think there's a challenge for the Australian church. Right. Are we actively seeking to reach those who come from a different background to us uh, when it, thinking in terms of economics? Mm. Um, another good book, I think, is this one, Tim Casey, okay. The Company of Heroes. Yeah, I've seen this, and it's, uh, but I haven't read it. Oh, it's it's brilliant. Look, don't right. leave here today without buying a copy. Okay. Um, it's it's really good. It's about twenty or thirty stories. It's just about God is working around the world okay. in different contexts to, to grow the gospel. And it's really challenging. It looks excellent. But stimulating stories. Mm. Excellent writer. Uh, Rosaria Butterfield says, you know, all Christians should read this book. Well. Really good published book. Published by uh, I think Crossway. Okay. Yeah, right. good publishers. Yep. But finally, one of the things that I think when I was a parish minister, I didn't think much at all about ministry to Indigenous people. Mm. Um, it's now right on well on my radar at the moment yeah. uh, here in Australia. So this book here, The Bible in Australia by Meredith Lake, uh, it won the Prime Minister's Literary Award. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a chunky book in some ways. Mm. But, but it's easy to read, I found. Easy to read, yeah. yeah. But woven through the story of the Bible's history in Australia is the strand about Aboriginal. Yeah, uh, history and uh, the interaction between Christians and Aboriginals in Australia, yeah. uh, which has sometimes been really positive and other times not so good. Yeah, um, it's hard to find a good accessible book mm. on uh, the history of Aboriginal Christianity in Australia, mm. and that's the closest thing I've found so far. Okay, there was a book called One Blood by yeah, John yeah, Harris yeah. years ago, but yeah. it's fairly chunky and thick and a bit dense in some ways and hard to get a hold of these days. So I think that's a that's a nice accessible. Okay. But on a personal level, if I can just step back yep. a little bit, in terms of your own walk with God and your own interest in missions, what books have been particularly impactful on you well, that the, have shaped you? Well, the Bible, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, a strange book in one, one sense, a mm. book called Sent to the River God Forgot. Uh, it's okay. about a couple of Wycliffe missionaries that went to a tribe in South America, mm. uh, spent all their life translating the Bible uh, went back and said to the tribal leaders, well, hang on, we've been with you all these years, here's the Bible. And the leadership in the villages said, yeah, thanks very much, so what? And that's not the success story that you usually read about. Mm. Uh, but it's a story of faithfulness. Okay. You're people that persevered mm. in, in the face of a fairly discouraging situation. Yeah. So I just, I just I find that admirable. Um, mm. So that's been good. John Piper's book, yeah. uh, Let the Nations Be Glad. Yeah, what was so good about that? I think John Piper's opening statement there, mm. uh, the goal 
the goal of worship, the, the goal of missions is worship. Yeah, it, it's not simply to lead people to Christ. Yeah, but it's to lead people to come to Christ to worship Him. Mm. And He says the day will come when mission uh, will be no more because people will be worshiping Christ around the throne. Mm. Revelation seven nine. Yeah, uh, that great tribe and company of people gathered yeah. around the throne, singing God's praises. Mm. So yeah, they've been two books in, for me, and also missionary biographies. Okay, um, you know. They sort of tend to merge for me after a while, you know, Hudson mm. Taylor, yeah. even Tyndale, Wycliffe. Yeah. I mean, it's all mission. Yeah. I don't think – sometimes in our minds there's the sharp division, you know, mission happens overseas. No, yeah. it's happening here as well. Uh, look, I just uh, – 18 months ago I read John Patton's autobiography mm. and yeah. it changed my life. It, it was just so inspiring. And, you know, a person that was part of the Sydney Presbytery for a, yeah. a little time and – but a part that – a person that was – greatly supported by the Church of New South Wales and the Church of Victoria. Um, I think it's, it's so important, isn't it, to retell these stories of the heroes of the faith yeah, yeah. and how God yeah, used them yeah. in just such dramatic ways. Yeah, about eight or nine years ago, I was at the assembly in Vanuatu and it was held in the on the island where Peyton ministered. Wow. I was staying in a similar grass hut, Yeah, I think Gilligan's Island, yeah. um, where he, was, he would have stayed and I... Um, I was reading his biography at the same time. That was a great privilege wow. uh, to be there and to be amongst the new Vanuatu. And to see the sacrifice that those early pioneer missionaries yeah, made. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, when Patton first went to the island of the New Hebrides now, yeah. um, you know, his wife was very young and yeah. she died within, yeah. you know, just months of them being yeah. there. And oh, just uh, some of the stories. And visiting the graves as well. Yeah, yeah, incredible. Um, just on that, how is the church in your estimation of Vanuatu going now? Um, uh, it's like any church. It's mm. got its strengths and it's got its weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that the Australian Presbyterian Church is really pouring its life and energy and resources into yeah. is the Talua Bible College over yeah. there uh, because a, a Bible college is very significant yeah. for the future of a well, church. Well, the old saying is, as the Bible college goes, so goes yeah. the denomination. Yeah. So over the years, we've sent lecturers, um uh, and we've also sent resources. I mean, yeah. we've, we're about to send quite a lot of money across to the Bobber College because it was so badly hit by Cyclone Harold about four or five months ago Yeah. Um, because we want to see the Bobber College up and running again. It's had to shut for the time being. Um, but we're heavily involved in trying to support the staff there and give them mm. the resources and the infrastructure yeah. uh, that they need so that they can teach the Bible because long after they are gone, it's the Bible, it's the Word of God, Mm. Uh, that will remain. Uh, personally, I'm jealous of Bible translators mm. uh, because long after they have gone yeah. to be with Christ, uh, the work that they've uh, engaged in, yeah. it continues to speak. Yeah, It continues to speak for generations to come until Christ returns. Well, look, I'm the pastor of the church where you were the pastor in Strathfield and uh, Robin Davies, yes. um, who was a missionary then and is a yep. missionary now yep. and has done fantastic translation work, is now sending people that have been converted to SMBC to train to go back to his pastors. And it's wonderful to see that come yeah, full yeah, circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my final question is, and and. And this is, I think, for me, one of the most important questions is because I know you're you know, the national director of ABWM, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you're also a pastor. You've been the pastor of a number of congregations. How do we not just support but partner with our missionaries in a really meaningful way? Okay, yeah. Any tips and advice you M could Mission's give? all about relationships. Yeah. Okay, so really important. So I think when uh, a missionary is preparing or even on going on home, on home, back on home assignment, um, having them come and speak at church, that's a bit of a no-brainer. Yeah. But get them to go and talk to Bible study groups. Yep. Um, uh, Midweek groups, you know, maybe men's ministry, women's ministry mm -hmm. and so on. Get to know each other. Uh, I think that's an important thing. Um, but then um, doing things like praying for them. Now... When I first came into this role, yeah, I didn't want to dive into preaching in churches straight away. So for the first four weeks, I went to four churches unannounced. Right. Um, three of those churches I went to, when it came to pray, praying, they just prayed for themselves. Yeah. But it wasn't until the fourth church, the smallest struggling church of all, mm. they were the ones that prayed for the world outside that congregation. Right. That in one sense was quite disturbing. Mm. We need to be praying. And we so when we say to our missionaries, we're praying for you, do it. Just on that, I I, I mean week I've noticed, by week. yeah, 
Yeah, well, that's a great challenge. I know, I know at our own congregation, we do it on a monthly cycle, but I'm thinking, why don't we do it more? Well, he, here's my thing. We pray each week. Um, we have, you know, prayers of thanksgiving and, yeah. and confession, and then later a pastoral prayer intercession. Yeah. Why don't we have in our services on a Sunday and in other gatherings a specific mission prayer time? Pray for local mission and overseas mission. Yeah, good point. And so if your missionary drops in unannounced, mm. they say, hey, Oh, the, the church is praying for that missionary. They, yeah. they pray for me as well. Well, it seems to me that we live in such a great age of technology now where um, people are so much more accessible for free mm, now, for mm. free. We can WhatsApp somebody on the other side yeah, of the yeah. world. And so I've said to people that are leading in prayer in our service, call a missionary this week. Yeah, Talk to them about how they're going. Pray with them yourself. Yes, And then when you come yeah. back and you lead us in prayer – Pray meaningfully with that. I mean, that seems to me a very realistic thing that we can also do, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And WhatsApp's great for that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, some people make the mistake of thinking, hey, the internet is everywhere all over the world. Right. Um, therefore, yeah. missionaries can access the internet really easily. No, it's not, so, it's not okay. true at all. There are some okay. places where the net goes down for three or four days, 14 days, um, and video is impossible. Yeah. Uh, come back to your question, though. The other thing that you can do, send your pastor. Send okay. your pastor to go and visit the missionary. Right. Um, if, particularly if they're from your congregation. Right. Because that says that we care enough to send a living letter, um, yeah. you know, a person to come and visit, spend a fortnight with you, see what it's like. Your pastor will come back, a changed person. Mm. Hopefully it will shape and affect his preaching as yeah. well. And it will affect the way in which he or she advocates and supports that missionary Particularly when the budget comes. Sometimes if yeah. things are getting tight with the church budget, the first thing to go. First thing to go is mission. Yeah, isn't first, that sad? And that really is quite sad. Yep. Here is my contention. The church has as much money as it wants to do whatever it wants. Yeah. But the money's not in the church bank account. It's in my bank account and your bank account. Yeah. And if we think something is important enough, we will go and get the money out of our accounts mm. and we'll invest it in, in some sort of gospel project. So, you know, as you yourself have personally gone and visited missionaries. Um, what are some of the things that they've said that has really encouraged them about their partnership or relationship with the church back home? Yep, okay. Any Anything in, um, specifically? Yeah. I, I, I think some of the things I've already mentioned, the pastor visiting, okay, or sometimes even a small team visiting, yep. but not being a burden. But you, you, you've got to go, don't you? Because I know our, our church sends mm. a mission team at least once a year. Yep. And the missionaries have said to us, don't come as if you're thinking this is a holiday. Yeah. Come thinking, what can we do to serve mm. and help strengthen yeah. you in your ministry? That, yeah. That's important. Yeah, it's got to be well prepared at the other end, and that can take a lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work. Yeah. Um, but things like um, sending care packages, gifts, okay. um, videos, greetings videos, just those sort of communication and contact. Yeah. And I think probably the primary thing is to know that they're praying for them. Mm. That's, that's the thing. Mm. Yes, okay. Sir. Have you got one more question for me? I do have one more question, in fact. You said that. Uh, <laughs> um, my, my, my final question is, if there was, as the National Director, yeah. you know, any one last word that you could say to all of the congregations or yep. all of the, the church leaders that are listening in on this today, sure. what would be your one thing that you'd love to exhort us with? Here's your chance. Okay, here's my chance. Uh, I think the Australian demographic has changed markedly. I mean, when I came to Australia as a four-year-old, we were pretty much Anglo-Saxon and we had one Italian boy in my class at primary school and that was the extent yeah. of any sort of diversity. That yeah. was it. Um, but today, Sydney, for example, Melbourne, Brisbane, we're just so incredibly multi-ethnic and in our regional centres as well. So, so we need to think more and more about how do we reach uh, the people in my local suburb who don't have the same background is so often many of our congregations we don't become do. this like uh, isolated ethnic ghetto ourselves yeah 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 so what strategies i mean what's the intersection between using what's the intersection between local mission and overseas mission because i think the strategies and uh, and, and attitudes that an overseas missionary uses to reach the local area where he or she goes we should be employing them here yeah um, and as i said earlier on uh, for people from other cultures, religion is part of life. Yeah. So we need to think far more intentionally, far more missionally in our own backyard. What does a missionary do? Mm. They go overseas, they, learn, they examine the culture, 
Mm. They look for opportunities. They learn the language. They learn the history. They form relationships. Isn't that what we can do here? Yeah. We know the culture, the language, the history, relationships, the food, but we've got to cross the bridge and actually go and talk to people. Yeah. Um, and I know in my experience, uh, again, uh, I, I think by and large, and there's some great exceptions, a lot of cross-cultural local mission work is actually going begging. Mm. Um, when I actually think it's much easier than working with Anglo background people. Yeah. Again, because religion is part of life. So at yeah. Herschel, we've seen a number of people become Christians yeah. in the last five, ten years from a non Anglo background mm. just because someone told them about Jesus. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's been so good to have you with Thanks. us and um, so good to be challenged again. I hope you've enjoyed this edition of AP's uh, Christian Profiles uh, amongst people, various people throughout the church. Uh, I hope you'll join us next time where we'll be interviewing uh, Reverend David Cook, former Moderator General of the Presbyterian Church, uh, as he talks about preaching uh, and what his insights are in relation to that. Um, thanks again, Kevin. Thank you. It's been great to have you, and we'll see you next time.